Hi there, I'm Sheila Wainwright and we're in beautiful downtown Easton, Maryland. We're in the basement of the lovely Avalon Theater. This is channel MCTV, channel 15, um, part of the Avalon Foundation. And I'm here with Will Howard. Will, it's always a pleasure, always a pleasure to, to talk with you. It's How are you today? It's my pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Well, we're here to talk about the Avalon Foundation and the Avalon Theater in particular. And I understand that you have been trotting around here since you were a toddler. True, very true. Tell me about that. My father was uh, appointed to be the manager of the Avalon Theater in 1938. He was in Plattsburgh, New York. He was with the Shine Theater chain. The Shine had just taken over the uh, theater and my father drove all the way down to Easton, Maryland. He'd t been told by his supervisor, who was pulling his leg, that Easton was a town of 50,000 people. <laughs> this is 1938. <laughs> and he tells the story of coming down Route 50, seeing a sign that said Easton, five miles, uh -huh. driving for quite some time and stopping his car and turning around and looking back the other way, and a sign said Easton, five miles, the other way. <laughs> So he came into town, he looked at the theater, he loved the theater, but he was depressed that he had been disappointed that he was getting this huge promotion. He was running a small town theater. So he stayed in a um, boarding house that's two blocks from here. It's on the corner of Harrison and Aurora. It's a bed and breakfast ah, today. Right. And he got a room on the second floor and he said he didn't unpack his bag for a week. Mm -hmm. Now a week later, my mother got off the bullet the train that used to come into Easton. Right, right. She was picked up by the superintendent of schools. She was coming from Boston, Massachusetts. Had three um, uh, swimsuits in her suitcase. She was coming south. To and they took her to the same boarding house where she met my father. And then Aww. nine years later, I was born Aww. just a few doors away. As a matter of fact, I was mm -hmm. raised right on Harrison Street. Mm -hmm. So you got to grow up there. What a, what a wonderful opportunity. Um, my so when you were little, <coughs> tell me, tell me about what was going on. Oh, wait, the, the Avalon Theater was every Saturday. All the kids, all the kids would go to to watch the Saturday uh, movies. Either you go Tarzan, or it was, it was uh, Hopalong Cassidy, or Gene Autry. Oh, the or good la old days. Later, later, Roy Rogers when mm -hmm. they got a little better in terms <laughs> of production. So, but the the man who was the doorman for my father. Now, my yes. father left a few years later and started a business in Easton and uh, he started the bowling center in Easton and the furniture business in Easton and uh, so but the doorman still let me in for free is that right yeah, the, my brother that original and I got rusher, in, got uh, in usher for, yep <laughs> got in for free that was went on for years ah oh, that's fa that's really fabulous now um, but then the Avalon the theater it got older it was starting to slow down tell back, us about the last shows back uh, the, the the uh, VHS cassette player uh, killed a lot of small uh, town movie theaters. That's what happened. And it, it happened in Easton as well. And the theater was being run at <coughs> in the 80s by Doug Hanks. He said he bought the theater when it was on the market because he liked the office. The office <laughs> overlooked downtown where, Easton. Where was the office? The office is where Legal Spirits is now. Oh, okay. And he sat in there at his Perfect. desk. Everybody could see him when they came to the intersection. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it was a great spot for him to sell real estate. But in, 19, in the mid-1980s, the theater closed. The last movie to play here was Cocoon. Cocoon, Cocoon. Cocoon 1. Cocoon. That there was were a, three Cocoons. Was a great, there were? I didn't know that. I just remember one, and that was a good movie. And the theater had yeah. really grown old. Its mm -hmm. nickname at the time was The Avalanche. Is that right? It was, I didn't know it that. It was really falling apart. As a matter of fact, it's one of my friends commented, it's the only movie theater that he's ever known that has rain delays. <laughs> it would when it would rain it would rain right inside the theater Ooh. Uh, so when it closed it got worse and there were pigeons mm -hmm. in here and it was terrible and as it turned out the back wall of the theater uh, the south wall was about to cave in mm. uh, the property had been on the market for three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars for three years there were no takers there was it looks like it, only one thing was going to happen and it was going to be bulldozed and the mayor didn't want to see that. No one wanted to see that. I didn't want to see it. I kept asking my friend Tim Kagan, who's a realtor, what's going on with the Avalon Theater? I had, at the time, uh, opened a restaurant called the Chambers Restaurant. It was located one block down on Dover Street, right mm -hmm. beside the courthouse. That's why we called it the Chambers. Okay. Oh. And we were very successful, and we were in our third year and looking at renewing our lease for another third year. 
But I wanted to buy the building. I, my father had always told me, don't pay rent, buy the building, pay yourself. And I made an offer to uh, Hoppy Stafford to take to Bob Bell. It was a verbal offer and offered him $280,000 for the building. Wow. And, and this was the mid-80s. Mid-80s. Mm -hmm. Hoppy came back and said, by the way, Bob's going to keep hang on to the building and maybe let give it to his sons, his oh. family someday. So I knew there was no hope of me being able to buy that building, and I wanted to look around for an opportunity. So I called up Dick Edgar. Uh, Dick Edgar was a businessman from Baltimore who has improved a lot of properties in the town of Easton. Yes, he has. And um, he bought the theater trying to see if he could put some deal together with the Academy of the Arts, the Historical Society, maybe combined, the mayor. No one wanted the building. It was too old. It was broken down. It was going to cost a lot of money. I hated to see it torn down. I didn't want to do it. And I called Dick and said, is there a possibility <coughs> that I could move my restaurant into some portion of that building? He got very excited. He called his uh, engineer, Walter Shamu, from Baltimore, and they quickly hand-sketched out uh, tables and chairs in the theater. And I said, that can't work. That can't work. I can't, I can't buy this whole building and restore it. But if there's a way that the town could take the theater and restore it through nonprofits by raising money, and that I would take the outside or the small, smaller sections and turn them into a restaurant. Now, we, our idea was to do three different restaurants. To do, we have one kitchen, mm -hmm. one manager, mm -hmm. but have three different themes. And that was my idea. Clever, clever. In the first floor, a theme was going to be very similar to Chambers down the street. Yes. Um, and we hadn't figured out a name yet. And the second floor was a dance hall. And when I went up there, that's where they st stored their candy and their popcorn. There was a wooden floor. Oh. And it was a dance hall floor. Mm -hmm. And as we look back into the history, there was also a small orchestra gallery there. And the there was a stairway up the back, and the members of the orchestra, the musicians, would go up there and they would play for people who danced on the floor. It was fantastic. And I thought, we've got to save that. So when, when would that have been? In the 30s, 20s, 30s? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you wanted to save that, all right? Right. So we, we had to save that. And I decided to make that a very fine dining restaurant. <coughs> My wife, Dorothy, was 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 my partner in the design and the concept and everything else and we decided to dedicate that to my mother mm -hmm. and we called that Cecile's my mother's name was Cecile lovely lovely and then the top floor we added later which turned out that that was a mistake but we when we calculating the amount of money we're gonna have to do we needed a certain number of chairs and we thought mm -hmm. let's maybe see about putting something on the roof I say it was a mistake because we lost a fifty thousand dollar uh, grant over that because they thought it really changed the exterior of the building. But anyway, oh. um, so we got big chandeliers and we got um, really elegant furniture and it was a very successful restaurant. When we opened, when we finally opened, the Baltimore Sun gave us four stars two years in a row. That was Cecile's? Yes. Okay. And only five of the restaurants at the time had four stars in the state of Maryland. So we were we were on the map and people were on the way from Baltimore going to the beach were stopping in and it was very successful the first floor legal spirits we changed right. that we, we we made that its name because in rehearsed researching some history we found out that there was a time during prohibition when there likely was some sort of uh, homemade stuff going from the basement up a dumbwaiter to the dance floor. I see. Well, that's very logical. So we decided okay. to have uh, the first floor as a prohibition theme restaurant. Uh -huh. And I went uh -huh. out and researched and tr tried to get as many prohibition era things as I could. Like Tommy era. guns. How did you ever find that Tommy gun? Actually, thing? we bought that Tommy gun from a Hollywood um, uh, supply house that supplied uh -huh. these two uh -huh. movies. Okay. So it was a real Tommy gun, except for the barrel was was full. Mm. But all the parts Good. were there. So that Tommy gun would work if it, had, if it was drilled out. And the outline on the floor? Outline on the floor, they, they stopped doing that at Legal Spirits. That was, I laid down and they actually did an outline of my body like I, I was a, I'd been shot. <laughs> okay. We had our waiters and waitresses wore spats. Oh, yes, it was I really that. cool. We had the, uh, 
sold off shotguns and things mm -hmm. on the wall. Mm -hmm. We had a wonderful time putting that together. The the uh, piece of stained glass came out of the New Jersey Senate office building, and it was blind oh. justice. Okay. And we bought that in Atlanta at an auction. I paid twenty eight hundred bucks for it. Is that right? It was so valuable to to us yeah. that we put bulletproof glass on both sides of it. It's a magnificent piece. It, it is magnificent. Now, if I remember correctly, all three restaurants had stained glass. Cecile's had. Um, it was. It's a famous piece of work of art. I'm going to embarrass myself. Um, it was. It was called uh, View of Oyster Bay. Thank you. It was a magnificent Thank piece. Thank you. Yes. And then uh, the restaurant on the top, the stained glass was, was the, the dome the over dome. the yes. over the bar. That was a really. That was also a pretty spot. A real pretty spot. Uh, we enjoyed eating there when you first when you uh, when you opened it. It was great. So now you've got. Uh, so tell me about the the rehab of the building. There are some great stories we, about that. We, we approached the mayor and said, would you like to keep the Avalon Theater in Downtown Easton? Of course, he said, absolutely. It's, it's a place where we've got to get it reopened, and it's, it's Easton Civic Center, mm -hmm. I think was the term he used. Oh, that was and uh, we were in complete agreement, and then so we devised a plan where we condominiumized the building. It was divided into different sections, mm -hmm. and basically the theater and the most of the, of the floor was going to belong to the, the town of Easton. Okay. The lobbies were going to be common area, mm -hmm. and then the restaurant portion was the very back of the theater, which became our kitchen. I see. And then Doug Hanks's office became Legal Spirits. Mm -hmm. Immediately over at the dance hall became Cecile's, mm -hmm. and then we added the third floor. Yep. And our co we were estimated that the cost would be three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for us on our side. Now this is this is nineteen eighty. Five dollars. Wow. Um, and it would cost the town about the same amount. You had a really, uh, you had a g very good architect who was helping you with that. Walter Shamu was great, and, and also I had a, a, a excellent um, interior decorator too. Very good, very good. Did you encounter Guy any? Guy Loveless is, Guy his, Loveless. is his name. Very good, He did Thank a fabulous you. job. Yeah. Did you encounter any difficulties when you were rehabbing the property, or Absolutely. did it all go nice and smoothly? Absolutely. When I, I learned a lesson, and that's never buy an old building. <laughs> it's full of surprises. We uh, came across a lot of problems, and my bill quickly passed three hundred and fifty thousand mm. dollars. Uh, George Murphy, the mayor at the time, realized that there were no place. The basement was only under Doug Hanks's office. It wasn't where oh. we're actually sitting right now. Uh -huh. We are underneath the floor of the Avalon Theater in the studio. Okay. So the mayor realized that they had to have green rooms and places for people to change and get ready and then go sure. up to the stage. And there sure. was no room. Mm -hmm. He tried to acquire the building next door, which is now Troika Galleries. Yes. And it wasn't for sale. Mm -hmm. So he said, we've got to dig down, which meant <laughs> dig down and create a basement under the, under the theater. Wow. Now, Hank Duncan, who was my partner, in, who was one of my partners in this, uh -huh. uh, Cliff Meredith was another partner in it. But Hank, since we had closed the restaurant at Chambers, mm -hmm. was actually supervising construction of our side here. And he called me one day. I wasn't in this building. He supervised it for me. He called me one day and he said, you're real bad news from the Avalon. And I said, tell me. And he said, I was all getting bad news. And he said, <laughs> you never got good news. Are you sitting down? And I said, no, but just tell me. And he said, no, you've got to sit down. I said, is it that bad? He said, yes, it's that bad. And I sat down and... He said, guess what they dug up in the Avalon Theater? And I said, you mean digging in the ground? And he said, yes. I said, an Indian village? And he said, <laughs> worse. I said, what could be worse than an Indian village? He said, the Tread Avon River. <laughs> That's worse. <laughs> and that was worse. I'm glad I was sitting down when I heard that. I immediately rushed over, and they had, they had dug into a spring. Oh. No. And water kept pouring in. Mm. So we quickly called our architect, Walter Shamoon. Now, this was not my problem. This was the town's problem. Mm. But the town's problem was also my problem. Sure. So if the theater didn't get completed, I couldn't survive as much money as I was spending on the building. So Walter devised a plan. Very simply, he, cr he said, what we're going to have to do is sink a, like a pan uh, into we're going to dig it out and keep pumping the water while we dig and then drop this thing in 
which is actually going to be a waterproof uh, pan. That's what he kept calling it, square, really? square pan. And there were some pumps on either side of it. Okay. And those pumps were to continue pumping the water, and they're going to pump it into the town water system, uh, sewer system, and he hoped that it wouldn't last long. Well, he was right. We asked to have two meters put in my office so I could actually see the pumps when they were running. Is that right? Yes. You, you were the one who was in control of, of monitoring well, I, the... Well, I didn't actually. It was my, my uh, administrative assistant was here. I didn't have an office here. But uh, it was something where somebody would be looking at a problem occurring. To we could do something about it. To make sure those pumps were operating. That Correct. was the Okay. Recently on a tour of the uh, same office... Uh, they they didn't know what they were, so they either just sheet rocked over them or took them out. But oh, those, right. those meters don't exist anymore. But we're not wet. Oh, my, no, my, I, feet, my are feet are dry too. Yeah, well, we're, we're all right. That was a problem. We're sitting in a pan. We are. That's what you're telling me. I love it. That was one of many problems. We had to repair the exterior wall that was imploding. That was very oh. expensive. That was a common expense between the two of us. Mm -hmm. It was a condominium. We had our own inside units, and the common area was the brick outside exterior. What happened was this ran up the bill for the town, and it sure. ran up the bill for us. Yeah. The town stopped construction at eight hundred thousand um, dollars. They couldn't go any further. The okay. voters were getting upset. Mm. The council was getting upset. We, of course, didn't have that option. We had to keep going. We finished our side at one point four million, mm. and wow. the the town. Um, the mayor suggested that we meet with the governor, Governor William Donald Schaefer, who came to Easton, went on a tour of the building, and later decided that he would award a $250,000 mat matching grant. Is that right? <coughs> so that put another half million dollars in, which eventually got the theater open. Well, um, that's, that's a good story to hear about Governor Schaefer. Yeah, yes. we, that that's good. So tell me a little bit more about that. Well, we he had a meeting. It, we, that we, this we, was we, the mid nineties. No, this was no, this was this was still eighty. Like eighty, this was like eighty seven. Okay. So we had a lunch over at the Tidewater Inn. Okay. Dick Edgar was there. Right. I was there. The mayor that was there, I believe, Jerome Nicolosi, who was the general manager of <gasps> the Tidewater right. Inn, was there. Sure, we remember him. And told him how important it was for this to happen, and good. and he he delivered. And that, and that was great. He listened. That is great. Now, the mayor appointed a committee to run the theater. And that mm -hmm. committee okay. was um, somebody who had background in um, ballet, mm -hmm. somebody who had background in performing arts, okay. somebody who had background in orchestra, and various different art forms, performing art forms. And, and mm -hmm. they had very much difficult time agreeing on what kind of performances to put in here. Everybody wanted uh, theirs. Th their own specialty, right. sure. So while they were having these discussions, and I'm open, we decided to rent the theater from the, b oh, the board. Your restaurants were open. My and restaurants you were, were trying opening. to get yeah, uh, we were customers trying to get, in there. We were trying to get, yes, right. fannies and seats. <laughs> fannies and seats. So um, so we the first concert we, we did was The Drifters. And that was actually the first concert in the new Avalon Theater. Cocoon was the last in the old theater, and the Drifters. The there's, there's got to be something about that, a story about that. And the Drifters were the first one. There were several the stories about that. The Drifters, <laughs> the Drifters were were from Manhattan. There was only one original singer left. They were very good. The price was five thousand dollars, <throat> and they told me, "Wow, we want cash." I say. I said, "I can give you a cashier's okay. check," and they said, "We want cash." Oh, okay. So um, <laughs> that was very unusual for Eastern Maryland, but that's <laughs> right. where they were. So the day of the of the grand opening of the this was not the official grand opening, but the first concert, which was sold out. And the only way we could afford to pay five thousand dollars for I think it was three hundred and fifty seats at that point in time, maybe it was four hundred, um, was to do two shows. So the Drifters agreed to pay for not play for ninety minutes. And we said, will you do two 45-minute segments? And they said, yes. We then got a local band. Yeah. Our local bands were all volunteering to come in to, to do the warm-up. Sure. And the way the acoustics is in the theater, mm -hmm. the, the crowd was just loved having a hometown opening band yeah. to open for the Drifters. Uh, the crowd went crazy. Every rolling. seat was filled. Oh. 
And they opened up, and uh, then out came the drifters, and the place went crazy. Now, I've got a, a, a video we're going to show here in a couple of minutes, but what happened was when you've got 350 people in the theater sure. for a 7 o'clock show, and then you've got a 9 o'clock show, you've got 350 people in line. Now, the line would go all the way past Talbot Bank on Dover Street of people mostly who had purchased tickets, so they didn't have to buy them at the door right. because it was sold out. Yes. So what we had to do is at the end of the show, when the drifters got so excited w because the, the crowd was... Was, uh, was, was loving them. Was loving it. It was such an intimate theater. They kept playing on and on and on. Well, that's the, it was time the to first show? Them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so the no, first show no, was supposed no. to be over at 8.30. All right. It was timed. Well, the first show didn't get over until 10 of 9. Uh-oh. So now we had to get 350 people out yeah. and 350 people in. Yeah. And we shot a commercial when this, actually this wasn't that exact show. This was several shows later that, uh, that shows the crowd out in the street as, th as it was changing. It actually blocked the street. And uh, maybe we can run that, run that commercial. Now. I can't wait to see that commercial. Thank you. Join the excitement in the heart of historic downtown Easton, the trio at Avalon, uniquely offering delicious fare for all taste buds from three establishments all under one roof. Legal spirits, informal pub atmosphere, casual meals, and fun. Cecile's Romantic Dining at Affordable Prices, and Chambers Penthouse, a local favorite featuring outstanding meals while overlooking downtown Easton. Join the excitement with superb dining, all of the trio at the Avalon in Easton. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of people in downtown Easton. That was Easton. about 500 people <laughs> spilling into downtown Easton. You notice that all the cars were stopped. Everybody was smiling. Everybody was having a great time. I love people it. People coming out of the show were saying, telling the people going in what a great show it was. And that happened over and over and over again as long as we had those, those, those split shows. We had the mm -hmm. Kingston Trio. We had um, the Marvelettes. We had all kinds of the oldies groups. But you also had Phil Donahue. In the lobby one day when I was over in the theater, I saw a gentleman with Phil Donahue on the back of his jacket walking around. And he was talking with somebody he was with who also had a Phil Donahue jacket. And they were talking in New York accents. And I thought... There was nobody there representing the theater, so I kind of yeah. just said, hey, can I help you guys? And mm -hmm. they said, we're from the Phil Donahue Show. We're going to be doing a story in Easton, and we're looking at this venue, and we're looking at the Talbot County Auditorium, mm -hmm. and we're trying to decide between which one. And I said, let me, sh let me show you the theater. So I took them in. I showed them how what the sound is in the theater. Mm -hmm. I know when we were restoring the theater, School groups would come in, and I would take a tiny little nail, just yes. a little nail about that big, yeah. and the kids would get up on the top, all the way in the back of the, and I would drop a nail on the floor, and it almost echoed in the back. It was so clear. So the, the theater is so live, so I demonstrated to them how live the theater was. I told them where they could position their cameras. I sold them on having it in a smaller venue. They really wanted to have more people mm -hmm. there, but they liked it, and they knew Phil yeah. would like it. So Phil Donahue shot in Easton. He had, he had about seven cameras. It was a <laughs> huge thing. They had a lottery for tickets. Uh -huh. It was a fantastic show. And I've got it. It's on my website, willhoward.net. If you go, That's go take a look at it. Willhoward.net. Go look at it. <laughs> you can see a lot of stuff on there, but you'll have to, you'll have to find that. I am pleased to greet you, America, from... Another wonderful place. If you haven't been here, I'm more than uh, happy to recommend it to your attention. I will not tell a lie. This is my first visit here, and it won't be my last. I am pleased to greet you from the proud community in Talbot County on the eastern shore of Chesapeake Bay. This is Eastern Maryland. That's why we're here. <laughs> if you had your choice, you'd rather we were here talking about something else. So that was great. That was a great show. But we all had other shows there, too. Um, uh -huh. We wanted to appeal not to just people going for oldies, but to more families. Uh, and 
I, I tried to find a theatrical group, a professional theatrical group, group that could put on um, a really good show. So I went to the Baltimore Actors Theater, mm. and they were then performing... Phantom of the Opera. Exactly. My son, my son went to see that. I think his first date was to see Phantom of the Opera. So we convinced them to come down and do shows in Easton. Mm -hmm. I went across the street to the Tidewater Inn and said, why don't we do a dinner theater? Clever. And our, our restaurant will have tables on the floor. Right. We'll sell them uh, th the ticket plus mm -hmm. um, the, their dinner right. and serve them there. And then uh, you can sell them uh, dinner in your river room or whatever it was at the time, and then have tickets for the theater. That wasn't done here at the time. That was that was it new. Had that never was been innovative. Done. It had never I love been it. done. We did that for ten weekends in a row. Ten weekends. We were packed ten weekends in a row. Oh. And well. I think the reason we had to stop is that the Midshore Center for Performing Arts had something that they wanted to put on as well. So mm -hmm. we had to end that. We came back with the same group uh, in um, December that put on a Christmas show, and it was a great show. One of the exciting things, my children were young back in those days, is the group came in and they said they, had, they needed a 14-year-old to be one of the actors, oh. and somebody that could sing what? and do some light dancing. What, did something happen to one of the actors one, in the group? One got the flu. Oh, dear. Mm. My 14-year-old daughter, Katie. No. Absolutely wanted to do really? it. So yeah, so she's she's in in the shot. You'll so she auditioned and, yes. and they cast her. Yep, they did. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so that was good. The the important thing was that we saw happening here is that the mayor's prediction was true. Right. That the Avalon Theater, when the Avalon was busy, all of the other restaurants were packed. Sure. When there's sure. something going and that's true today. Yes. In my restaurant, my old Chambers restaurant back in 1983, mm -hmm. we opened it in 1981, okay. we got business after every show in the Avalon Theater. It was predictable. We, we had servers come in because the Avalon Theater was, was letting out at a certain particular time to take care of these people. That was usually the 7 o'clock show or, or even the 9 o'clock show. They, oh, there was a 9 o'clock show, and they get over to 11. The other one would have a seven, 7 and a 9, open. and we'd always get a little blast. Mm -hmm. uh, I afterwards. can believe that. I can believe that. And, yes, you're right. The the restaurants, uh, I notice it just being around town, the restaurants are fuller, of course, after a show. But it's not just the restaurants. It's the other businesses in town. The other businesses. It, well, it's a trickle-down effect. I mean, it, it, the waitresses all get money. They all make money. The servers make money. The owners of the restaurants make money. And they then hire more people, sure. and it's vital for the downtown to have this this this, this structure here. It it absolutely is. I um, oh, actually, I just remembered something, and I want to go back to. The, uh, it's so uh, it's very intriguing to me uh, the the building of this. I like building, and the uh, refurbishing of this structure. Um, if the Avalon Theater were to close, mm -hmm. to go dark again, mm. it would be. A terrible, it'd be a travesty. It would directly affect every business in this community. It would directly affect every business, and uh, especially in a recession. So it's my hope that someday that the Avalon Foundation can fund themselves enough that they can convince the town to deed the property to them and that they can take care of it and, and fund this building forever for everybody that's yet to be born in Easton to be able to enjoy this fabulous, fabulous theater. And I, I got to tell you, I haven't mentioned Ellen General's name, but uh -huh. Ellen General and the Avalon Foundation, uh, when times did get tough and when the theater did close, and we can talk about that another time, uh, it did directly affect everybody else in Easton. Yes, it did. She and was she, she was a real pioneer. She was wonderful. Ellen, the way she hung in there. Ellen went to the town and, and said, "This makes no creative. sense for you to have this beautiful building here and have it empty." Now, Ellen needed support from the town, but Ellen kind of came back in and put it all back together again, and ran the new uh, yeah. Avalon Foundation. She's very very creative. I, I I admire her a lot. I know. I last weekend I was standing. Uh, I was out here uh, on this this corner, 
and looking at the corner of the Tidewater Inn and the Bullet House and, and that lovely office across the street of, uh, across the street and, and this building too. And it's it's the prettiest square on the eastern shore. It's, it's, it's lovely. It's a cornerstone in Easton. When the uh, my dad told me when the Second World War ended, it was uh, VJ Day, victory over Japan. Okay. That people came out, from farmers came out, everybody came out to celebrate, and they celebrated right out in front of the Avalon Theater. Is that right? It was VE Day and VJ Day. Oh. The celebration was here. When my father was running the theater during World War II, every Saturday night they'd have an auction. Now this, the theater was packed every Saturday night for uh, old movies. They, they, were, they were talkies back in those days, but they would have an auction. And he told me about auctioning off a pig. <laughs> a really? pig. A pig that was going to be butchered. And that, okay. and it, it, back in World War II, getting, oh. getting good mm. meat was a, was a challenge. I guess it was. And Dad said that Charlie Louie from Charlie Louie's Laundry okay. spent probably his savings on demonstrating to everyone in Easton that he was in favor of are winning the war. He was, oh. he was from J some Japan, some Japan probably. Yeah. But uh -huh. I remember Charlie Lewis <laughs> laundry. Anyway, Where was he it? bought that pig. It was uh, right beside Nevis Har Harbor. Okay, all right. Yes. The downtown Easton. <laughs> so that pig right downtown. Oh, they, they auctioned off all kinds of things, but but he remembered that distinctly. Uh, I actually, I'm going to ask you another story because. All of us who have walked in the Avalon, we see when you walk in that the front door, there's a picture, a photograph, large one hanging to the right, and there are six uh, lovely women from it looks like the 20s. That picture was yeah. we we re researched that picture and others from the historical society. Yes. And that picture was taken of ladies who are getting ready to perform in the Avalon Theater. And again, they didn't have a green room back in those days, so those people were actually at one of the Langsdale houses. That was a Victorian house up the street. Okay. They were doing their, their practice rehearsal, mm -hmm. and they were singing, and they later came here and sung. But H. Robbins' Holidays captured that mm -hmm. shot of them preparing. But an interesting thing, in the early 90s, I had two managers on duty, a manager and an assistant manager. Now, we had an elevator that... Once the elevator was, the elevator was never in the old Avalon Theater. No. We, we put it in back in 88. And it, but it was always moving up and down. On and its own. On its own. By but itself. I just thought that's, it was doing its thing. And uh, <laughs> okay. one of them was sitting out in the front of the, where the uh, elevator was. Uh, this was at midnight. No, it was at 3 o'clock in the morning. We had closed. They were taking inventory. Okay. It was in the wintertime. And they said the door opened, and they turned and looked, and they saw a woman, a ghostly image of a woman, who looked, who was dressed exactly that way. And they said they were stunned. The, the assistant manager was looking at this ghostly, it was, they said it was half invisible. Yeah. And the manager came down the stairs, he was on the third floor, he came down and came around, and he spotted it as well. Oh, my gosh. And this, this image uh -huh. just drifted right through the doors, the closed doors right. of the Avalon right. Theater. <laughs> but, but when she was here, actually performing when she was alive, there was no elevator. There was no <laughs> elevator. No. I later asked the elevator guy came to do his annual inspection. I said, "What? What makes this thing go up and down?" And he said, "Buttons, push, <laughs> pushing the buttons." <laughs> and I said, "No, no, no. This thing goes up and down all the time." He said. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and I said, it does. Don't you have a program to go up and down? He said, no, only if there's a fire. Oh. It would Just return to the first floor and open the doors, only as long as there was no fire on the first floor. It would right. seek out a door where there is no fire and open. Oh. He said, that's, that's the probably. only automatic program. But we've got, we've got our ladies who, uh, who travel around this building, and they use the elevator. There's, I love it. There's never been any spotting of any kind of a ghost since I've, uh, that I've ever heard of. I unfortunately have not seen one either, but I'd, I'd like to meet her. It's a lovely, lovely building. We're very lucky to have it in our community. We're incredibly lucky to have Will Howard here, who, who has a great knowledge of its history and, this is, and this a is short history. Uh, we were required uh, to recent. wear helmets oh, that, that's what this during is. construction. Yes, so yes. I got, a friend of mine made this special and, uh, helmet for that me. 
that looks like uh, the way it's written. It looks like something out of Disney. The way it's written. <laughs> well, it, it was a graphic designer that did it. Oh, Her name okay. was Sandy Brower, and she mm -hmm. thought that it was a, uh, it was a, uh, it, it's Superman lettering. Can you can you see <laughs> That's that? That's what it is. It's Superman, <laughs> and that wasn't me, Superman, but it was a super <laughs> Superman project that we were taking on. It's wonderful. Thank you very much, Will. I'm I'm glad to hear your stories. Thank you. Thank you.